Um, well, hello from, uh, from interior Alaska. It's a beautiful spring day with uh, uh, some snow coming down, uh, 15 degrees Fahrenheit, that's above zero. Um, so, so this is um, kind of a story of, of, of an ongoing and an exploratory venture to, to realize what's been a longstanding vision of making numerical weather prediction available as, as a software service. Um, Boreal Scientific Computing is, is just me. It's a single member LLC meant to facilitate consulting and, and contracting activities. And one of those activities recently has, has been uh, taking part in the uh, Developmental Testbed Center Visitor Program. And um, I, before I, I move on, I need to just issue the basic disclaimer that, that I will have expressed some vision and opinions, and, and they are my own, uh, not necessarily shared by DTC. And uh, so let's move on here. So, so, so kind of a, a, um, a, an outline of, of uh, what we're going to go through today is there's an ultimate goal to, to support easy and flexible access to, to numerical weather prediction environments. And, and so in, in this rendition, it involves constructing the pieces that are necessary to execute components of WARF in the AWS cloud. So this means the underlying uh, horrid details uh, while, while building the abstractions that, that hide the, the user from, from those details. The, um, this makes heavy use of, of the uh, DTC's NWP Docker containers, which, which they've developed for other uses and, and turned out to be um, perfect for this use, and, and they're being deployed in the AWS Elastic Container Services. And so this presentation is going to um, be kind of heavy on, on the motivations and vision, and then talk about the, the methods and, and the current status. So one, one scenario that, that, that drives this vision is, is that of, of being able to model uh, volcanic ash transport. You might hear the helicopter, we're, we're near an airport. Um, we get volcanic eruptions around here and, and the ash is, is a hazard to aviation. And so figuring out where the ash is gonna go uh, tends to be a time critical event here. Um, Peter Webley, who used to be with Alaska Volcano Observatory, now he, he does other stuff with the University of Alaska, and, and I used to have, have a lot of talks over this, and, and there was this dream of when a volcano is ready to erupt, let's set up a, a, a wharf run over it, a, a regional high resolution uh, simulation generates the meteorology, and then use that to determine uh, where, where the ash might go. And, and ideally, we would do this in an ensemble mode. And we'd need to do this quickly. So, um, uh, and, and on a custom domain and, and such. So it would need to be automated. And I used to think about the pajama factor where if, if, if the volcano, uh, as we say, it went red at 2 AM, we would be able to essentially push a button and have these simulations run and results available for us by the time we got out of our jammies and, and in the work ready to, to start figuring out what the next steps were. Um, an equally inspiring application came from Emily Niebuhr. Some of you might know her. She's been with Alaska Region National Weather Service for quite a few years, and she took a few year hiatus um, and became the first meteorologist at the United Nations World Food Program in Rome. And, and she came to me once uh, I was with the Arctic Region Supercomputing Center at the time with an interest in, in a scenario where we would monitor GFS and, and, and look for, for potential signals of, of upcoming severe weather. And, and when something started looking interesting, we would generate uh, wharf simulations at high resolution and use those to, to gain uh, maybe better situational forecast. And so again, the need would be sporadic. It's not like we always want something running, but when we needed it, we needed it. And, uh, and we wouldn't even really know what the model setup was and, until the time came. The initial thought was to try to do this on, on our supercomputer, but uh, for, for a number of logistical and even political reasons, it, it just seemed like it wasn't gonna work. And, and this is when, when I really started getting an interest in trying to do this stuff in the cloud here. 
So the Holy Grail, the, the, the long-term motivations, which uh, have a long way to go still, is that we wanna be able to launch weather simulations so that the details are hidden. We can base them on, on custom domains and parameters and workflow configurations. We don't always run WARF in the same sequence. And so that we could start running them immediately on short notice and essentially unscheduled. And I've already told you about some of the target scenarios um, others include back of the envelope research experiments, uh, weather service people have come to me asking for help in setting up a model run uh, to do to, to look at um, um, standing waves um, over over islands in, in the Bering Sea. Um, and for students or, or those of us who need to do last minute simulations before a conference presentation. The, the target audience is generally atmospheric scientists, very skilled, who, who, who understand the modeling process, but they don't have the skills and or the patience to actually get in under the hood. And any of you who have run, run WARF know that, that there's enough hardships involved, in, and this has been a limiting factor for a lot of people. So some of the requirements to, to achieve this, this long-term vision, uh, one in, includes the ability to immediately access the computational resources we need, and perhaps on a very infrequent basis. So we don't just want a supercomputer sitting around waiting for us. Uh, we, because we want the flexibility, we need fine-grained control of the components of numerical weather predictions so that we can arrange them in, in interesting ways. Um, and so along those lines, we, we need uh, good APIs to, to help coordinate uh, these, these processes. Um, really important is we need a, a stable environment where every simulation is going to get its own dedicated resources. We're not going to have to worry about it competing with, with others on a supercomputer. And what I, I really think is, is, is very important and where the containers come into being is a non-changing operating environment. I mean, how many of us have, have set up operational runs only to have them go down because of what was supposed to be a trivial system upgrade. We, we just can't have that. Um, and ultimately the return on investment um, relative to the solutions that are out there needs to be attractive, which, which isn't always the case. So to satisfy these requirements, um, the, the cloud bursting paradigm is, is big. We have to consider that for the most part, we're not gonna need these resources. Um, so, so we could, consider a scenario where we have a supercomputer and when something big happens, we preempt everything and uh, it may or may not work, but ultimately when we need them, we need them, uh, you know, no dilly-dallying. Um, the, the vision here is, is one of loosely coupled distributed services, which, which I had a bunch of slides on, I finally decided to, to remove them, that will allow us to create custom workflows. And of course, abstracting away these, these horrible, tedious details. And so when it comes to abstracting away the details, um, those of us who've done this know that setting up and running WARF is hard. And, uh, and some of us get used to it, um, but when you're, you're new at it, when you don't do it frequently, it's time consuming and error prone. Um, and, and it's been my experience, I've, I've taught a number of WARF tutorials for, for University of Alaska people it's been my experience that good atmospheric scientists with reasonable Unix skills come into the tutorials and they're all excited. They, they got to run a weather model and they've got plans and, and they come to me two weeks later and, and they forgot it all. They, they don't do this stuff on a daily basis. And, and so, so they end up not doing the modeling that, that really might help them. Uh, just a couple slides uh, uh, to... to, to um, give you flashbacks. Uh, uh, just installing WARF can be very problematic with all sorts of compile problems. Uh, it, it involves low-level usage of Unix file systems, including tools that will make symbolic links to other files. So, so it does get tedious, and it's very error-prone. So, so some of the, the driving concepts I'll, I'll go through through each of these. Um, it is, is the following. Um, the grid is, is a primary driving concept. I, I was fortunate to come into this business in the mid 
90s when the idea of a computational grid was, was, was just coming to, to fruition. And there was this, this idea that we could treat computational resources like an electrical grid, just like we plug in a lamp and get electrical resources from we don't care where, we don't care how, we just get them. We would be able to do that with computing resources. And maybe to some degree that's true, but, but the, the one part that I was really interested in and I used to promote to my students was, was that we'd be able to to run these complex simulations with simple interfaces. You'd go to a web page and quickly say, I want to run this, and somewhere out in the world, things would run for you. Nowadays, we can, we can think of, of, a, of what I'd like to think of the Star Trek paradigm, where you say, computer, run this, this simulation with these parameters. And, and I'm going to suggest now that at this point in time, the pieces are all there. You know, back in the 90s, you know, there were a few supercomputers out there that you'd have to get special access to. But every one of us has access to all these components that would allow us to realize this vision, but it ain't easy. Uh, and, and so the challenge really, is, in my mind, is, is building the plumbing that's going to put this all together and do that in a way that, that hides, again, this horrible complexity, I use that term over and over again, from, from the user here. Uh, the idea of virtualization and containerization has, has, has really uh, been a, a driving concept. And, and, I mean, we've been dealing with virtual machines since, since IBM's VM operating system in the 1970s, and, and they've been very useful for, for many reasons. But, but more recently, They've matured to the point that, that we can script them. We can use Chef or something, uh, infrastructure as, as code, that they like to call it. And we can share these virtual machines easily. And, and they can have this property that, that I insist on, that we have a non-changing computing platform. Once we've found something that works, we freeze it. And, and we don't change it until, until we, we've tested it thoroughly again. Um, so with this in mind, the ideal interface, if you're prone to dreaming like, like I am, would be kind of restful, um, those of you who ventured into that, where we, we might imagine uh, just, just one component of, of a wharf sim simulation or, or the pre-processing met grid, where we, we, we have uh, a, a module in, in AWS that will intercept URIs for us and allow us to specify a, a particular endpoint here, uh, where we want to get uh, particular input data from, where we expect to put output data, and have it done. And, and in this kind of scenario, it's, it's been impressed upon me in, in my little exploration of REST, in this kind of scenario, the, if, if we have all of these endpoints set up correctly, the creation of the interfaces to, to actually run these custom models essentially boils down to just forming the right URLs and, and putting them together. And, and that, of course, is the real challenge. Well, then there's the real world. There's the it's going to have to do for now interface. And, and, and this is what I'm, I'm working on now, this I, idea that there, there's still so much complexity in just drive getting a service to, to run, a big service to run in MechGrid, and I'll talk about some of those problems in a minute, and then getting it to do what you want, that I, I just, I'm not even going to think about uh, putting it behind an, an API right now. I simply have a Python backend client that will go through the operations um, as, as I go through a learning and exploratory process here. The... Um, and then, of course, there's, there's this idea that, uh, that DTC, for, for at least a couple of years now, has, has been uh, providing, and, and I believe the Wharf Hydro Cloud uh, people are doing something like this also. I don't know exactly what. Um, but they've provided a set of Docker containers for the NWP components, and every one of those is, is, is a perfectly, I think, perfectly set up. Wharf environment that allows someone to go in and do what they need without having to install Wharf, without having to set up directories and, and such. Um, these were developed, or they have been used, as I understand it, more for education and training purposes. But it turns out that, that these are just perfect for what I need to do. I, I don't have to worry about the details of setting up 
or for anything to, the, that layer is already in there. I just need to worry about the, the plumbing and such and, and directing some of these operations. So to get this into AWS, um, I, I, I've been impressed in my, my learning with the AWS microservices paradigm. It's, it's slick, it's, it's powerful. It's amazing how easily you can, you can set up some simple web services and, and serverless um, processes with, with Lambda and, and Fargate to, to do some interesting stuff in the cloud. And, um, and, and so it's, and it seems if, if you go through some of these tutorials on AWS usage, this seems to be the approach they always advocate. But then the problem is of course, NWP isn't a microservice. And that's like, so I call it a micro ha ha service. It's not, not can't really treat it that way, but we, I kind of want to go with that paradigm. Um, and, and so of course the NWP processes are huge. They might run for hours. Um, and, and even just sending a, a, uh, um, a request and a response, well, a request consists of input files that might be hundreds of megabytes in, in size. And so, so ultimately what we end up with are asynchronous processes and, and, and we need to be able to treat them um, as, as if they were or through some sort of a synchronous interface if we even wanna consider this microservices paradigm. So the um, um, kind of the service implementation um, is, is that the client will launch a service like this MetGrid service that I'll show you a little more about in a minute. Um, we'll launch it into AWS and then keep track of it while it's running. So ultimately to launch it, we will provide arguments to the service where to find the input files, where to put output files. Once it's launched, we query it and so we can understand what its status is. And, and this is one of the more challenging aspects. Um, and then upon successful completion, we will know and verify that the output files are in a specific S3 location in AWS. And then of course we shut down the service because we're paying for it. And so a simple workflow might, might look as follows where I, I'm, I'm starting off with, uh, with a client, a test client on the outside uh, with a bunch of, of GFS met files. And one of the first things I wanna do is, is run ungrib. So I, I tell it where the GFS met files are and, and, and ungrib will launch and over time produce the ungrib files available for the next step or, or two steps from now. Likewise, we can run geogrid, uh, which will produce geogrid files available in S3. So everything stays in the cloud, which is good. And then finally we can run metgrid and uh, it, it, we, we tell it where to find the ungrib and the geogrid files, and it produces the metgrid files. And of course, this might take several minutes. So it's, it's a micro haha -ha service. And so it looks simple. Um, I've already explained what we've done, and you ask what could possibly go wrong. And of course, there's a lot. And uh, I'm already running short on time. So we know lots can go wrong here. And, uh, and, and that's, that's the problem. So, um, what we'd like is, is, is to make a way that, that the client, once we can't just have the client launch the service and hope everything is gonna work for us. Uh, we need a way to probe it and, and at least understand where we're at and be able to detect problems that, that might be happening. So um, the approach here, um, ignore this container on the left-hand side. It, um, I'm only con uh, concerned with these two is the idea that in the context of AWS, we consider a task that, that has related containers. And, and what I've done is, is built this NWP service container, which is based on DTC's container, and then a separate web service container. And because we can share volumes, we can share file systems between containers, ultimately the NWP service is in addition to running stuff, it's going to immediately start creating some logs of what it's doing. And, um, and then it's just gonna do its thing and we're not gonna interact with it directly, but the client can go ahead and start querying a web service container, which has access to the actual run directory. So we can query it and it can find out what's going on. It can look at some of the logs that are being created for us. Um, the actual Docker components very quickly are, are based, again, my 
WARF WPS services is based almost entirely on the DT Center's WPS WARF. Um, and then I have, have my own simple web service, just a, a basic cherry pie web service. The, um, uh, from, from a Docker file perspective, you can see that, that we, we bring in the, um, uh, the, the DT Center's container. And I just add a few things here. In fact, I don't even need EC codes or AWS CLI for what I'm doing. They're just for debugging. And I copy some of my own Python code in there, which essentially just drives the, um, the already installed um, uh, WARF components that are already in there. And I've been doing that kind of stuff for years. So that's, that's kind of easy. And likewise, the, um, the, the web service is simply a Python cherry pie service with, with some of my simple uh, Python files that, that'll, that'll run this web service. And so uh, the overview here is, is that we launch these two services in separate containers. The web service has read-only access. The NWP service does its thing. The first thing it does is it starts setting up a subdirectory where it's going to start putting interesting logging information. And, and at every milestone, it's going to update that, that, that list of uh, that JSON file, that, that list of, of uh, dictionaries. Um, it, it's going to do what it needs. It's going to get the input where it needs to get it from, and it's going to start running things. And the web services' sole purpose in life is to simply wait for status requests. And when it gets a request, it can look in the run directory or in the service status directory to help it respond to the query. Uh, the key design goals is, is, is I'm trying to keep the, the, both these services as simple as possible. In, in short, um, all they do is the processing. I, I don't want them to make decisions here. They uh, ultimately, that the web service should simply tell me what's happening and it's up to the client to figure out what to do with it. Um, there's, um, from the perspective of the client, um, a, a, the client is going to have to know where the input data is, what, what the S3 objects are. It's going to need to uh, ensure that there is a viable S3 output location for the data. It's going to need to, uh, put a name list in the appropriate area, and then it needs to start the service. And this is where this is where all the work has been, or ninety percent of the work. Um, uh, once the, the the code is everything's running in AWS, we can actually start calling the service, which is fairly simple. And and then we periodically will pull the web service for these status updates. Uh, this is just a quick sample of of a query to the web service. If I, I query the status log and the color coding just differentiates between the different log entries. And uh, so I can see what's going on at different times here. I wanna make sure I've just got a few more minutes here. So, so the plumbing is the hard part. The implementation of the actual NWP service isn't that hard. Um, TTC has done most of it. I've spent years building code that runs worse, that's not an issue. The web service is simple, so it appears easy, but the, but the huge bulk of the work is that there's a lot of details in just launching this thing and making sure that things are, are running correctly here. And so what the client really needs to do is, is just some of these here. It needs to verify AWS, and that's this client out here. It needs to you know, make sure that, that S3 resources are set up and then it needs to get into the nitty gritty and, and set up a virtual a private cloud, kind of a private network here, um, needs to, to create an EC2 instance. And a lot of these calls are non-blocking or synchronous. So, so you might call to start an EC2 instance, but you need to keep going back and checking that it actually started correctly. So it, it becomes uh, more and more crazy. And some of you might be thinking cloud formation uh, to do this. That might be a, a future approach, but, but right now we're still just trying to understand what are the details. Uh, the development and debugging, uh, a huge number of degrees of freedom, all kinds of things can go wrong. Any of you who have worked in this AWS environment have probably run into these gotchas that, that aren't that well um, documented. Uh, so TDD has been imperative. 
uh, I'm able to, to take these containers and do a lot of the testing outside of AWS, because if you test it in AWS, well, you've got to bring up the, the whole system and, and that takes a lot more time. Um, once you're actually running stuff in AWS, um, it's really hard to, to understand what the service is actually doing. And so you need to do some creative logging so, so that you can then go into CloudWatch and look at those logs afterwards. Um, using PyTest, very tedious. Um, uh, up to now I've got 102 tests. It's, it's, it's building, but, but this is imperative. The next steps here is, is the WARF pre-processing system is almost done. Um, at that point, I'm going to kind of pause on this development and try to build a higher level client um, that, that really hides these details and, and, and put it out for a couple of users to use and then move on to, to WARF and NWP services. And finally, I'm simply going to suggest that this is something that has to be done. It's the realization of that grid vision that we've been pushing for, for 25 years, that at least in this context still hasn't been done. I don't know of an easy way to do it, but, but we've got to do it. And um, again, I'll suggest that the pieces are out there available to anybody and we've got to just, just put them together and that's the challenge. Thank you.